I don't know if you were here last weekend, but I'd like to, if you were, then I'd like to continue some of the thoughts that, that we had from last week. Sorry, I'm just sorting myself out here. But I'd like to um, maybe ask you one or two questions first. Um, just you can, you know, you can answer from where where you are. I don't know how people work out some of their thoughts about Christmas, but sorry, I don't know where people get the um, these statistics from. But um, here's a question: What 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 percentage of the British public own a Christmas jumper. Any wild guesses? 38. 38. Any other wild guesses? 90. 90. Actually, you're not far off. Uh, 82%, supposedly. How people work <laughs> that out, I have no idea. How many official white Christmases were there in the whole of the 20th century? Official white Christmases. Five, eleven, two. What's a white Christmas? <laughs> Seven, supposedly, is the answer. Okay, here's one. Uh, all right, this is an easy one. Uh, what color was Santa Claus originally portrayed as wearing until Coca-Cola got its hands on him? Green, absolutely. What traditional Christmas food was historically illegal to eat? Swan. Swan would have been illegal. It would have been illegal any time. Um, a, a, a traditional classic Christian uh, Christmas food: turkey, mince pies. Um, Charles I banned both mince pies and Christmas puddings in an effort to stop gluttony. Okay. And you get the answer to this one and then you'll understand possibly why. How many calories near as thousand do they estimate the average Brit consumes on Christmas Day? Five thousand? Six thousand. The answer, I suppose, is 7,000, and that's just the average. Um, again, I don't know how this has all worked out. But... How many turkeys are cooked on, in the UK on Christmas Day? On Christmas Day alone? Two million? Supposedly 10 million. And how many rolls of... Tape are sold on Christmas Day, around Christmas. <laughs> Supposedly, the answer is six, six million rolls of sellotape. Where do we get all these Christmas ideas from? And what are our Christmas ideas, our own Christmas ideas, based on? I don't know if. Uh, you read the church letter or the article that I, that I put for the church letter. But the, really to save having to reinvent things, I, I used the same letter um, for the courier. I, I, there was, there's, a, there's a crossing point piece uh, where different ministers are um, you know, they're on a rota. And there's others who are not ministers too. And, and, and they're not... All, all Church of Scotland ministers anyway. But I used the same one, and I was talking about the virgin birth. Um, and anyway, I was very interested last, last night that, uh, you know, I read uh, there was, that, it's, that it stimulated a couple of letter responses in this week's Courier. Um, one from a, a, an atheist and the other from one who appears to be heading that way. Um, and they're questioning, you know, what I was saying. 
in one sense, it quite pleases me. It quite, you know, I feel quite chuffed because obviously you do wonder when you write any of these things, does anybody bother to read them? And, um, you, and part of my purpose is to try and stimulate a, a, others' thoughts. However, um, I'd like to reply to that, and I've got till lunchtime tomorrow to, you know, if I want to get it in, in, in this coming week's career. Um, my purpose wasn't at all to have a go at anybody or to have a go at, certainly at atheists. My question really in, in that article was to say, how, if we believe in God, what on earth is the problem with a virgin birth? And because there are, there are quite a number of um, people who, who testify to faith in God, but then start questioning all sorts of things, as if it couldn't possibly happen. Well, I mean, if it's a God, then, then what's the problem? And so from, from that point of view, if, if once we accept that, I mean, I, I, if someone's an atheist, I wouldn't expect them to find anything credible because you're starting from a totally different position. You're starting, you've ruled out God from the start. So, of course, you're not going to find any of it credible. But as Christians, we're, we're, we're called a faith. And, and there, is, there are credible reasons to, um, just to trust the witness that, that we have in Scripture. Although if we actually follow through what the Bible says, it actually becomes immensely challenging to our thoughts and our perceptions and how we're looking at life and then how we live our lives. And sometimes, of course, we, because we, we want to fight off the challenge that we, that we hesitate to believe some things. Because, you know, to accept something um, um, if we really take it into our hearts then it means that we're going to have to refocus and reorientate how we're living and how we're doing things. Part of the purpose of the article was to really to point out that it's not that actually the virgin birth is is of importance because if it was a Jesus the person is our salvation. It's not just what he did and what he says. It's Jesus. And our salvation is a gift from start to finish. It's nothing in humanity. There's nothing we do that contribute to the salvation. We just receive it as a gift. And if, if Christ's birth was in an ordinary, normal way, then God is in effect co-opting or adopting something that humanity does naturally. And the whole point is, no, he doesn't. The gospel is for the helpless. If it's not for the helpless, then it doesn't really touch the very poorest and the most needy within society. And so God doesn't help them that helps themselves. God helps the helpless. He comes to the aid of people who have nowhere else to turn. And that was part of what I was wanting to draw people's attention to. But anyway, I've gone until lunchtime tomorrow to, to respond. I only saw the thing last night. I've got till lunchtime tomorrow if I want to get it, it in. And so if you, if you remember me and your prayers at all, then you could pray that I get something, something credible done. The, the, the people who wrote, wrote very courteously. Um, and and um, um, Anyway, I, I just think it would be good to have a response. One of the things I was saying last week, and this is one of the challenging thoughts about, uh, about Christmas is that it wasn't that there's a, I'm sorry that 
we were looking at a God making the human race in his image, in his, according to his likeness. But the Bible never really unpacks what that means. And so there's a lot of speculation, and there has been, within Jewish, over the centuries, within, uh, over, over the millennia, uh, within Jewish um, uh, um, circles, and after Christ, also in Christian circles. But what the New Testament recognizes, and, and we looked at this, this passage, and I've, I've put the basic reference at the bottom of the sheet, you came to understand Christ is the image of the unseen God. The firstborn of all creation. Now these are astonishing statements. In him all things in heaven and earth were created, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And this was part of the revolutionary understanding that the, that the early church came to, as they understood that actually the image is Jesus. Humanity was made according to the image. In other words, although humanity, uh, you know, the human race, came into being long, long before, it was always created with Christ in mind. As it were, he's the firstborn, even though he was in after or later. He is the prototype, even though he came afterwards. So it's all... And, and, and that turns things upside down. And I know that's... that's um, maybe it's a bit of a challenging thought and, and, and we sort of wonder we may wonder well is this actually relevant but actually if we can wrestle with that thought it begins to change everything and turn it upside down see in our passages we read this morning And, and, and we find this in other parts of, of the New Testament. Jesus is not some kind of special human being. Or is. And I think we're often tempted to think that he was. Or is, rather. Jesus was an ordinary human being. He took the Son of God, you know, he didn't stop being God but when, he, when he took on human flesh, but he became an ordinary man, an absolutely ordinary man, like you, like me. Our passage in Philippians, being in the very nature of God, he didn't Consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be held on to. You know, he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant, made in human likeness, found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's, that's talking about the humility that we see in Christ. And it's the humility we have in God. And this recognition that it was normal, ordinary humanity that, um, you know, that um, um, the Son of God took to himself when, when the Word became flesh is, is a crucial point for us. I mean, common humanity is that's our, ex our sinful experience. But it's still ordinary humanity. So what we find is that he became an ordinary human being, but lived as an ordinary human being 
in perfect harmony with God. In absolute trust and faith toward the Father. In complete openness to the Holy Spirit. So when he, when he healed, he wasn't doing it because he was the Son of God. He was doing it as an ordinary human being in the power of the Spirit, in faith and obedience to the Father. He walked by faith, just like we do. He walked by faith. There's nothing special apart from the Holy Spirit that enabled him to heal. So we have a story when he went to Nazareth and it says he could not perform any miracles. He could not. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was grieved at the prideful attitude of the people and the Spirit was not working through him. So he couldn't do anything. To pick up on some of the thoughts from last week and what I was saying about um, humanity made in the image of God, when, you, when we read the passage in Genesis 1, and again there's, there's other references to this picked up in other places, but not stated quite this way, God said, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, the, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humanity in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over a living creature that moves on the ground. In other words, God, God intended for humanity and to, have, to be his special representative in the earth and to have dominion in the earth in his name as a gardener, as a steward, to nurture the earth, to bring order and, 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 and to, uh, uh, to um, minister in his name. Sometimes that is criticized, that thought of dominion. I was in the car just this week and there was an, and I was listening to a, to a program um, that um, Radio 4 and it was somebody in the British Museum who was taking us uh, and, and, and referred specifically to the Jewish Christian idea of humanity having dominion in the earth. And said that this idea of humanity being given dominion is, is, is the fundamental reason in our Western society that, that we have abused our relationship with the earth. And was very critical of that. And then went on to talk about all the wonders of, of different pagan religions in their supposed harmony with the earth. And unfortunately, you can only listen to these things. The problem, now actually, the Jewish, the Old Testament talks an awful lot about respect for animals and, and the earth, and there's a huge amount in terms of its relationship with the land. The problem was not dominion. The thing is, they're made in the image of God to be his representative, and as his representative, exercise dominion. And our problem was that lack of harmony with God. So therefore, having this position within creation, we now abuse our relationship with nature. The problem is not the dominion. The problem is the breach in harmony with God. The lack of faith, the lack of openness to the spirit, the, wanting, the desire to do our own thing and go our own way. It's the exercising of our own will 
in contradistinction to God. So, of course, Jesus doing. So, of course, I'll just come. So, of course, what happens is once that relationship with God is broken, everything else begins to go awry. The relationship with the earth, relationship between men and women, and 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 and, and sin uh, uh, has an increasing sway over humanity. We uh, we become incapable of. Um, dealing with many of the other things that, that come against us because we live in a um, potentially hostile world where there's earthquakes, there's, there's, there are volcanoes, there's all sorts of things can go on in nature. We live, we are, we are spiritual, um, uh, spiritually orientated creatures who, and so there are also uh, unseen spiritual forces that assail us. And once the breach with God um, comes into place, then we don't know how to deal with these things. And, we're, and, and we make the best of it sometimes, and even that's not good enough, and sometimes we, we do the exact opposite, and we, and, um, we actually are so stubborn in our own ways that actually, um, it actually make things worse. And so one of our big concerns today is our concern for the environment and the, and the role that people have played in, in bringing some of the environmental issues um, to the fore. Made as God's representative, but not representing him. And what Jesus does is he becomes an ordinary human being. Subject to ex- all exactly the same temptations that we have. The Bible says that. He was tempted in every way, just like we are. But his uniqueness is that alone amongst the human race, he lives in perfect harmony with God. And so when he talks about the devil, he says, the ruler of this world come, but he has nothing on me. He's got nothing, nothing on me. He can say, I do only what I see my father doing. He can say, I, he can say to God, he can say, Father, I've given, I have given them the words you gave me to say. I've brought the message, but the words. Perfect harmony with, with the Father, complete openness to the Holy Spirit, but as an ordinary human being. And so he does and this is, this is the thought that actually turns our thinking to some degree upside down. When he heals, so he then for takes dominion over sickness. He takes dominion over death. He takes dominion over the evil one. He takes dominion over the water, the waves, and the storm over the wind. This is an ordinary human being doing what God had created ordinary human beings to do. Now, the implications of that are enormous. See, we're apt to think that our experience is ordinary humanity. No, it's common humanity. It's our common lot, our common. But real humanity, as it was created to be, as it's intended to be, we see in Christ. And the implication of that is is if that's ordinary humanity, then look how far adrift we all are. Look how far adrift the human race has become. How out of sync with the Father. How self-will, our ignorance, and, and, and how blinded in all our ignorance. And that's our common lot. Because that is authentic humanity, as God created it to be. And that is a hugely 
challenging thought. Jesus not only takes dominion, in the name of the Father, he ministers forgiveness. He brings mercy. He expresses the heart of the Father in the way that he conducts his life and the way he lives. This is not a special kind of humanity. It's just ordinary, authentic humanity as it was intended to be. And our experience is not how God intended it to be. It's our common lot. But actually, it's almost a dehumanized humanity, if I can use that kind of language. But as soon as that becomes apparent, we also read about the cross. We also find about the cross. He, that, that he exposes the human situation and then he brings the solution at the same time. And therefore, you know, we, we have to hold Christmas and Easter together. So he's not saying this. He's not, he's not coming to condemn the world, as he says, but so that the world through him might have life. He's actually come to deliver and to save. But, the very, but we, we cannot receive that salvation unless we're willing to acknowledge that what we see in Jesus is the authentic, ordinary humanity as God purposed it to be. It's we who are out of sync, and it's us he's come to save. And the reality, therefore, is that as we bow to Jesus in our hearts, as we learn, and we learn this, it's not something that we can, we can do it once and we'll have to do it again and again and again and hopefully get in deeper and, um, uh, all the time. But as we submit to him, as we bow, as we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and we allow the Spirit and, and Christ just bring us into greater harmony with the Father, then we see, and that means a giving up of our own independent existence, to come into harmony with him, to live in union with him, to live in the power of the Spirit, as we do that, we begin to see more and more the life of Christ expressed in our lives. Some of the things that are in Jesus characterizing the way that we are. Christ is the image of the unseen God. We are made in accordance with that image. And when we see Jesus, that's what humanity was intended to be and do and live. And that throws everything else into question. That actually our common experience is way adrift. And but as soon as that's exposed we have this affirmation of mercy. Don't be afraid. I've not come to condemn. I've come to deliver. Because God sees that humanity adrift and doesn't abandon it. He remains absolutely faithful. So there's some challenging thoughts.